The lab today will be led by Emmanuel Benjo and Julian Roy. Emmanuel is ML, is ML scientist and leads the exploration unit at Valence Lab, where he works on GFLONET and the application to molecular generative models. He did his PhD at Miller under Joel Pino and Doina Prekop, studying generalization in deep reinforcement learning. Julian is a machine learning scientist also at Valence Lab, and this is PhD working on imitation learning, constraint reinforcement learning, and reward specification. He's now applying these techniques um, on the, in the context of active learning for biological data and molecular generation. Thank you both for doing this and uh, looking forward to it. Let's welcome the speaker. All right. Um, this time. So, yeah, well, you've heard about molecular generation today, uh, and now we're going to make you practice it a bit. Um, there's a lot of techniques you just heard about, like diffusion. This morning you heard about uh, VAEs and all that. We won't have time to cover everything, unfortunately. Um, today on the lab, we'll cover these three techniques. Uh, one is kind of this more traditional approach uh, around genetic algorithms. This one is a new approach you've heard probably Joshua talk about called GFLNets. And the last one is based on language models. If you heard about like smiles generation, so we'll cover that. So um, I'm gonna kind of introduce motivation, although I'm sure you've heard about this a lot already, but like molecular space is amazingly huge. Um, there's a lot of different spots in the space that we've kind of explored chemically in the real world. So we have kind of some data to get started with. Um, but handle the rest of the unexplored state space, right? So we need models or we need algorithms that will help us um, explore this a bit more smartly than going at random uh, as, as one might try in the first place. So another important aspect of this is usually we're going to need to assume we're doing some optimization, right? So we have some, some score function, some reward function, that we're trying to maximize. Um, this might have kind of different aspects to it. Maybe there's multiple objective functions you care about. Um, but globally, we'll, we'll have to assume that kind of thinking about FFX is someone else's job, taking that and then using that function to get our exploration of the entire state space. So um, hopefully you've heard about genetic algorithms, but if not, this is the gist of it. You maintain this population of uh, objects, uh, members, right? You select some of them uh, and you mutate them, right? So you do little local modifications to uh, the population itself and you kind of prune away the things that don't work as well, right? So it's, it's, it's iterative processing where um, you end up kind of by virtue of chance and the chance can be not heuristics that you put into the, the mutation to make it more sound, uh, you end up kind of progressively of, of chemical space. So that works really well because, well, it's really fast. Like editing a molecule is just a bunch of Python or C code. And then scoring can also be fast if it's a model, like a, a, um, can be a bit slower if you're using more physics-based approach like docking uh, and so on that you've heard about yesterday. Um, but generally, this is something that's pretty fast because there's not much like learning involved. And as I mentioned, what's kind of the trade-off here is that because you're doing these local modifications to your molecules, um, you end up only performing a very local search, right? So you might kind of travel around and find something interesting there, travel around, find something interesting there. Um, but you'll never kind of end up very, very far away from where you started from, unless you're willing to wait for a very long time. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> yeah, I guess this will be the, the first part of the lab. Um, should we jump into the notebook yeah. now? Okay. So I will um, give you a moment to I think open up the, I don't know how you've been doing this, but like open up the portal link, um, maybe get, get your laptops out, get this ready. Um, 
the yeah so what we'll be doing uh for the first part of the lab we'll be looking at these two libraries uh one is, is metchem and the other is GraphGA. so metchem basically contains a set of heuristics that i was just mentioning and those help you guide the generative process because they contain kind of this um set of knowledge that chemists have been and computational chemists have been synthesizing for a very long time like a drug-like molecule should have kind of this weight approximately and this much lipophilicity and all these aspects um so medchem is a great library that kind of regroups all these algorithms all these heuristics um graph ga a particular implementation of genetic algorithms specifically for molecules that operates directly on the molecular graph um, and it also implements a bunch of heuristics to not just make absolutely random modifications, uh, but to make modifications that kind of preserve uh, the kind of uh, realism of the molecule, if you can say it like that. So I will switch to the lamb. Oops. Oh yeah, if you have the slides, which are also um, um, the portal, well, the portal has all the links, so <laughs> it should be fine to go there. Yeah, let me just start here. Um, let me just show of hand who has like the collab open and is just waiting for me to forward. Okay, let's wait another minute or two. So what we're going to do is kind of just uh, kind of go through it. There's some to do's that you'll notice scattered around the collab, um, and then we'll we'll let you do this first part. Um, and obviously raise your hands if you have questions we'll be going through the those <laughs> try to answer questions Cool. Uh, show of hand again. Who's ready to go? All right. Julian, do you want to? I would walk through and then let them explain. All right. So um, so if you're ready to get started, uh, the first step would just be to, to install these dependencies on the top. Um, we'll, we'll try to go relatively quickly through that part uh, to stay on time with, with the break, uh, and then we'll, we'll probably slow down a little bit more for the second part uh, with GFlow Nets. Um, so this should take a few seconds. I guess because it takes a little bit of time to install the dependencies, it's probably good not to uh, restart the kernel or reload the notebook throughout the uh, uh, throughout the session. So once we're done, we're, we'll be good to go. Uh, so I can start talking about the the, the next steps that are coming. Uh, so after installing these dependencies, uh, the first thing uh, we're doing here uh, is instantiating the the predictor uh, model that I think uh, you have been working on in the first uh, lab of the summer school. Um, so I believe this is this is predicting uh, the binding uh, affinity to uh, to EGFR. 
Uh, and so we're going to use uh, this predictor as our uh, RF of X, so our guiding function to generate new molecules. And so uh, as Emmanuel has explained, uh, with genetic algorithms, uh, this function is going to be used for filtering of the molecules. So uh, the goal is to, to generate uh, uh, random mutations of our different candidates, and then at each generation, uh, we'll, we'll filter them with this core function. Uh, so we just start by just taking a look at uh, how different molecules uh, score. So you might have this uh, restart session after the installation is done. Uh, normally, this shouldn't be a problem. Uh, we should be able to execute the other cells. So let us know if that's an issue, but normally we're good to go. Um, Okay, so so yeah, so we're just uh, taking a look at how uh, different molecules can score here. Um, so we're we're taking as input uh, these these small representation, uh, and then uh, con converting them as molecules and feeding them to our predictors over here. Uh, and this is what we get. Uh, so the first the first thing that we'll want to explore is how to use this MedCam library to enhance uh, our, our current predictor. So our current predictor at the moment is only uh, predicting the binding affinity to EGFR. Uh, what we'd like to do is maybe augment it with some of uh, uh, middle, uh, medicinal chemistry uh, knowledge. Uh, so what we're doing here is that we're importing this, this uh, library, MedChem, um, which implements for us uh, a whole lot of different filters uh, that are used as rule of thumbs uh, for developing new compounds. Um, so what we're running here is this, this first uh, filter, which is often referred to as pains, which identifies uh, molecules that are kind of like overreactive and not very specific. Uh, so these would be molecules that uh, may look like a hit when you do a virtual screening, but in fact, they just, they just hit on everything. And so you may want to discard them and not actually test them in the lab because they're kind of like false positives. Um, so it, it's a set of, uh, of basically chemical rule of thumbs that identifies whether a uh, given molecule is likely to be a pain. Uh, and in this case, we can see, you know, that uh, a lot of the molecules that uh, we had as candidates uh, are flagged as, as potential uh, overreactors. Uh, but we have a few that don't. Um, and another example, maybe, of, of one of these uh, filtering rules um, is that uh, Lip uh, Lipinski uh, rule of five. Uh, so this counts the number of, of hydrogen donors and receivers uh, in a few in a few other criterion, so that's something you, you can uh, look up on Wikipedia. Uh, and so basically, this tells you whether a given molecule is likely to have uh, properties or characteristics that are uh, often attributed to to uh, approve the compounds. And so again, we can see that this time a different subset of the molecule uh, passed this test. And so the idea with these kind of filters is that you can try to fold them into your your scoring function uh, to have a, a single scalar by which you judge. Uh, your different candidates. Um, so this is what we're doing in, in, in this next cell. So uh, we'll, we're building this uh, EGFI, uh, EGFR score, which is combined by uh, our predictor that we had before. Uh, and now we also uh, check whether it passes the rule of five and the pains uh, criterion uh, and divide uh, the score by two uh, every time the, the, the filter is unhappy. So we, we basically discredit uh, the potential value of trigger these flags. Uh, so now we're equipped with our new scorer, uh, and we have kind of like a, a modified version of uh, classifying these different candidates uh, uh, with respect to their potential usability. So did most people get to that part? Or are there like technical issues with the notebook or are we flowing through? Okay, that's great. Um, all right, so, so now that we have a good scoring function, now we're ready to apply it uh, to different molecular candidates. Um, and so using this uh, graph GA library. So, uh, so basically the, the goal of this um, tutorial, you know, it's, it's just an hour and a half, is to give a, a bunch of different pointers to a good starting point for molecular genetics. If you're interested in genetic algorithms, this is a good place to start. Um, uh, so we're gonna use uh, this one for now. Uh, one of the molecules that we, we have been looking at uh, previously. Um, and so we get, we get its score. Uh, and now the goal is to apply uh, uh, kind of like random uh, modifications to that molecule. Uh, so to have an idea 
of what a single step of this genetic algorithm could look like. Uh, uh, we can run run the cell over here, uh, which basically specifies to, to the method that we just want to go through one generation. And so this lets us see uh, what amount of modifications a, a, a single a set of random mutations can, can make to our molecules. Um, so I believe this is still loading, but like from the previous run, uh, we can, this gives an idea of, of the kind of modif modifications we get. So it, it's quite, uh, we can take quite big steps in the sense that some, some of them will remove uh, uh, large sections of our molecules. Uh, while others can add additional fragments or, or recombine it. Um, and we can see that we have quite a, a variety of different modified scores. So uh, our initial molecule was starting at uh, 5.7. Uh, now we, you know, we have some candidates that uh, score uh, well below that and higher. Um, so that's a little progress over the set of, well, over our uh, individual candidate that we had. Uh, but this this kind of method is really meant to be applied uh, in an iterative way over and over. And it's really by filtering uh, these candidates at every generation step uh, that we're uh, biasing our population towards uh, scoring high with our predictor. Uh, so this is what we do in the cell. So again, we're just using this uh, out of the box. And now we're asking it uh, to run uh, uh, up to 20 generations. And so in between of each of these generations, we'll filter our, our pool of candidates uh, and then recombine them, uh, uh, recombine them, grow the population again, and uh, only keep alive the, the candidates that are most fit. Um, so basically, yeah, the, the result of, of, of that generation step, it takes quite a bit of uh, more time, uh, but in this case would be uh, much higher scoring molecules. So because we're filtering uh, away the, the poor candidates at every uh, step, we end up with just uh, uh, the best scoring candidates. And so something we can notice about this set of candidates is that uh, they're much higher in score than the initial starting point, but they're also quite similar to one another. So we started with this uh, individual route, and there's only so far away you can go with, uh, with local modifications. Uh, and that's kind of like the main drawback of this, this family of approach, uh, which is uh, akin to uh, uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain methods, is that if you have multiple modes in your uh, molecular space uh, that are interesting to discover, uh, you're exponentially uh, less likely to get through this, this desert of score and uh, traverse a region in between two nodes uh, as the distance between these, these modes uh, increase. Uh, and so this is one of the motivations uh, for de novo generation to maybe use some uh, approaches that that really start with uh, you know further away from the molecules that we already know, uh, and this is what we're going to be exploring in the second part of the tutorial. I think we're, we're almost right on time with with the break. So uh, uh, with that, you know, feel free to to read in more details uh, what's in the notebook. Maybe uh, uh, you know take some. Uh, head start for, for the next part and uh, in 30 minutes so at 3.30 uh, we'll be describing a little bit how GFlow nets work and how they can be applied to a fragment based molecular generation all right thank you see you in 30 minutes all right uh, welcome back can you hear me well perfect um, okay, any questions about the first part of the lab, uh, just to get started, so uh, about like genetic algorithms, uh, graph GA, uh, were most people already aware of that, of that library, or it's like uh, something new you might, you might use? Uh, okay, well, um, so for the next part, we're going to go with uh, a bit, uh, you can think of this, this family of approach as uh, generating molecules a bit more from scratch. Uh, so I think this morning uh, you've heard a bit about GFlow nets already. Uh, and so now we're going to talk about how you can apply GFlow nets uh, in the case of molecular generation. Um, okay, so, so we've talked about this uh, molecular space. We've talked that uh, genetic algorithms tend to discover solution uh, surrounding the clusters uh, that we already know and have studied. 
Uh, a different way, uh, a bit bolder to go at molecular generation is really to generate molecules from scratch. So you would start from the origin, the empty set, uh, and then you can think of building new molecules as building a Lego block, so uh, piece by piece, um, and then submitting these, uh, this, these finished molecules uh, to your predictor such that you can evaluate whether they, they are interesting candidates to test in the lab. Um, so uh, you would go step by step and you were really formulating this problem as a sequential decision making problem uh, where you're taking different actions in a state space and gradually building your object. And this uh, will lead you to, to novel molecules that are outside of, the, uh, of the, the, the clusters that you already know. Some trajectories uh, would likely lead you to molecules that you already uh, uh, knew about and then uh, others if you run it for long enough uh, will go beyond uh, uh, the clusters that we knew and into more complex uh, or uh, original molecules um, so there's different ways to instantiate that framework uh, at its core you need to to formulate it as a markov decision process so this this state space that you traverse by taking different actions um, one particular family of algorithms that's really well suited to tackle the problem is uh, is called GFlowNets. Uh, and so, so have you, uh, as you've heard this morning, so uh, the, the central uh, uh, property that uh, makes GFlowNets a good candidate for that type of problem is that uh, they learn to sample uh, these finite, uh, th these finished molecules, so these uh, terminal objects in your state space, uh, proportionally to their reward. Uh, and so in this case, we can think of the reward function as the score that our predictor and our set of filters uh, attribute to the molecule. And so any agent, including a random agent, can take actions in that state space and transition from states to states. Uh, but what GFlowNets uh, uniquely do is learn a distribution over the terminal states X that is proportional to R. Um, and this gives you diversity because you will likely have multiple modes that have kind of equivalent scores uh, in this uh, gigantic state space. Um, and if you have methods like uh, regular reinforcement learning uh, that try to traverse this state space, you'll probably find a, a good or maybe even the best trajectory uh, to the terminal molecule. Uh, whereas a GFlow net uh, will try to sample from all of these different modes. And when you take into account the high level of uncertainty that we have about how accurate our predictors are uh, uh, with respect to the, the, the real world properties of the molecule, uh, you definitely want to be sampling from a lot of different modes to give you the best chance to validate uh, these properties in the lab. Um, so in the case, uh, so you can instantiate building molecules in, in many different ways. Uh, one of them would be to build them uh, atoms by atoms. Uh, what this will lead you to is uh, probably a lot of unrealistic molecules because uh, uh, then it, it, you rely completely on the model to learn what is a chemically valid molecule and what is not. Uh, so that's a very, very rich state space to explore, but very difficult to learn in. Uh, something that's a, a little bit uh, more um, uh, reasonable as a machine learning problem and still realistic uh, chemically is to use uh, molecules fragments so you can have this library uh, pieces of molecule that you assemble uh, by attaching them to specific uh, attach points uh, and so you can define uh, a fixed number of fragments uh, that molecule is allowed to to be made uh, of and then explore the combinations in which you can assemble them um, so once you, your, your GFlowNet is, is trained, you can think of it as uh, this model that has this flow of probability uh, across the space. And so if this particular fragment on top uh, tends to lead to a, a larger number of molecules that perform well on our predictor, uh, it will favor it for, and then uh, in the next steps, uh, favor the different paths that lead to, to high rewarding uh, terminal states. Um, so this leads us to the second part of the tutorial. So in the same notebook, uh, uh, you can now uh, start uh, going through uh, the GFlowNet section. So here we were using uh, uh, the library that Emmanuel has been developing uh, for, for a few years now uh, at Recursion and now at Valence, uh, and uh, that is equipped uh, with a bunch of different tricks, models, and uh, uh, formulations of the task to generate uh, molecules with GFlowNets. All right, let's go back to the notebook. Oh, <laughs> well, I guess I'll do it um, just showing you. Um, 
rather than, than running the cells, but typically it should just work. Um, yeah, so we kind of just presented this, but um, I've you know left this in a notebook if you want to learn more, if you want to have the kind of math nearby. Um, but basically, again, the central aspect of GFLONATS is that we're learning this flow function um, and, and these kind of flow policies. And the math leads you to have equations that describe the ideal state of this GFLONAT. And then uh, from this ideal state, these uh, consistency equation, we can infer learning objectives. There's a bunch of them. Um, for today, we're just gonna use trajectory balance uh, because it's stable, works well, and is already implemented. Um, so as Jean just mentioned, we're gonna do some fragment-based design in this lab. Uh, the way you do this typically is you have a large library of molecules and you kind of chop them up and see what are the most common subgraphs. Here, I've done this already on Kembo uh, to obtain 50 common fragments. And I've uh, shown you here. There's a bunch of algorithms to allow you to derive fragments. Maybe the most common, I think, is bricks, um, but there's a whole lot of them. So yeah, this is this will be our, our fragment library for today. Maybe a note on this as well is that um, if you have a kind of good idea of the thing, you may actually create fragment libraries that are that contain parts of molecules that you know are going to be, let's say, binders, right? Then within your building blocks are already kind of good sub answers. That's usually a good strategy when when using these fragment based approaches. Right. So we have uh, a bunch of these fragments that I'm showing here. Um, now here we're just going to import all the things. Um, so the GFLANT library kind of tries to separate different concerns. Um, you'll notice that there is like the model. Oops, sorry. It's like the model part, uh, which here is a graph transformer. There is like the general graph building environment that we're operating upon. Um, here we have this environment that you basically specify what are these graphs? Here they're graphs of fragments. And we're gonna have our training objective here, trajectory balance. Um, here I'm, I'm creating all of these objects uh, in, 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 yeah, in the cell. Uh, in particular, I'm kind of setting the config to have a not too large model. So I'm creating a four layer graph transformer. Um, there's lots of default arguments in there. Uh, go take a look if you're curious. Generally the default values are kind of decent, but as a general rule for machine learning, you always will need to kind of, uh, is that a question back? Yeah. Why did you set the mass fragment to five? <laughs> um, so there's, there's multiple reasons, I guess, because those fragments are already kind of big in a sense, if you're trying to design a small molecule, you don't need too many of them. Um, you could not set a max, right? And Maybe the model would discover, oh, if I generate something with a hundred fragments, it's going to be really too big, and the reward is going to be zero. Um, but um, here, a priori, we kind of know the size of the molecule, or like an upper bound on the size of the molecule that we know will solve the problem. So, um, kind of just restricting the max number of fragments uh, is is a good idea. There's also some other kind of problems with large molecules, sometimes tricking reward functions, but it's another, another topic. Cool. So yeah, instantiating uh, models and everything, environments. All right, so one thing we can do with all of these things is sample new things. So here I'm just, the model hasn't learned anything yet, but I'm gonna sample some trajectories from it. All right, so as Jenea mentioned, the way we create those molecules is you kind of start from scratch, and you take a bunch of constructive steps to create a molecule. So here I'm, I'm sampling it, and here I'm printing the first trajectory, just showing that uh, the model is choosing to add a bunch of nodes, which represent fragments. And then here it sets these edge attributes between the nodes, which represent how exactly the fragments are attached together. Right. So if, if you imagine that you have these uh, ring uh, fragments, right? let's say these two things, there's kind of a variety of, of edges that you can uh, attach them with, uh, sorry, atoms that you can attach them with. Uh, and so the model is, is given that freedom of choice. Cool. 
so yeah any questions so far concerns are people able to oh yeah question Are you actually training the model as you're sampling or is it like pre-trained? No, it's we, <laughs> we're going to use that data to train the model, right? So, so this, this is kind of a code side effect, but uh, we're creating the model to create new molecules, but specifically we'll need a bunch of little quantities so that after that we can take a gradient step on the model. The, that's the naming of the function, but like this could have, been just sampled. Um, okay. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Good question. <laughs> Any other? Any other question? Existential crises. All right. So, yeah, we've we've sampled the trajectory. The agent at some point says, "I'm done." Takes the stop action, and uh, again, we can look at the result. Just going to be this okay looking molecule so great we can produce molecules um here we're going to create a task which is this concept within again the gflow net code base we're going to inherit from an existing task with just to make everything easier but in theory you can redefine uh, lots of different aspects about the task uh, for example the different like conditioning information you want to feed it if you want to have a conditional task um, and how the reward is transformed, let's say using temperature uh, or some multi-objective kind of parameterizations as you can have there. This is all handled there, but for now we'll just kind of overwrite this so that uh, when we ask the task to compute the properties of, of molecules that we're giving it, it just returns the score from the score that we've um, defined above. Important caveat here, I don't know if we've mentioned uh, in the GFLAND framework, the reward is assumed to be positive because it's assumed to be this uh, unnormalized probability density. Um, so this is why there's this clip here. Uh, maybe make sure if you if you've developed models that you're loading in from yesterday that you either like renormalize them so that they're positive or take the exponential or just something that will make it positive. Generally, that kind of just works fine. Um, and yeah, so here we're creating this, this task for the model. And uh, we can, sorry, I need to stop clicking. <laughs> we're, we can use this task now to compute a reward that uh, we will be able to, again, train the model with. So here I'm just showing how it's done. And again, plotting the reward that the model got, the, uh, just freshly initialized model got by generating these modules. So um, as I was saying earlier, thanks to the question, these trajectories kind of contain the right information so that we can construct this batch object that we can then uh, compute the loss with. And once we have a loss, well, we're using torch. So we just do, you know, loss backward up that step. And magic, you've trained your model. <laughs> Obviously, we want to do this a bit more than once. Um, so here's this kind of very standard training loop. Notice here that the loop is basically sample trajectories, uh, convert them to objects, compute their properties, um, convert those properties to reward, and then as we've just done, construct the training batch, compute the loss, do a step. So one thing you'll notice is that I'm using this beta parameter here. Um, this is pretty important in the GFLAND framework and in some other frameworks as well that use these anomalized probabilities. Um, because we're not trying to maximize the reward, we're trying to just like learn this reward proportional model. Um, it's useful to use a temperature parameter that will kind of squish or make more peaky your reward function. Right? This will make your model uh, end up focusing more on the high reward regions. Um, and in the, in the limit of like a very low temperature or very high inverse temperature beta, um, a very low temperature, you'll end up kind of making the model as greedy as possible, which is not necessarily something you want because then uh, that will prevent the model from exploring. It might get stuck in these local minima. You don't want that. 
so yeah, the, these temperature parameters can be a useful way to kind of make your model more or less greedy. So we have that here. Um, so if you got here, maybe run the cell, it might take a few minutes to run. So if y'all are running this, uh, maybe it's time to check for questions. Oh, question over there. Hi, thank you. So basically you are creating four trajectories and you are somehow reweighting them and trying to get the score between them after all the procedure, right? So what happens when you start actually increasing the number of trajectories or increasing the number of modifications that you can get? How complicated it actually gets to train this type of algorithm into something that can go into production mode? Mm. So um, this is, we're training a graph neural network essentially, right? We're training this graph neural network to predict the probability of actions. And those actions are, do I want to attach this fragment or this fragment or this kind of stuff? Um, and so this is, this is a machine learning problem, essentially. Typically, the bigger your batch size, the uh, lower the variance of your gradient. So bigger batch size will make optimization more stable. There's a downside to that. Obviously, bigger batch size means more compute. Um, and also, I mean, depends what camp you're on in terms of the theory, but Bigger batch size can lead to more overfitting, according to some. <laughs> There's some cases where that's not true. Um, and yeah, like another part of your question I sense was about modifications to a molecule. Yeah, so here we're not modifying molecules, right? Every, every new trajectory is you start from like an empty molecule and you build it up constructively. Um, and at the end, the agent says, okay, I'm done building it, and it gets a reward. And then you start over from scratch. And the advantage of doing that is that you are bootstrapping from the model the generalization abilities. You're, you're uh, taking advantage of the fact that it will imagine, oh, there's probably stuff over there. And if that over there is far away from what you've seen, uh, that can be good. Because methods like the GraphGA we saw just now or other Monte Carlo kind of algorithms um, will have to, if they wanted to discover that new region of the state space, they'd have to like travel all there via edits. Whereas this uh, starting from scratch at every new trajectory gives you this extra freedom. Question? Yes. I was wondering how you make sure that the molecule you end up with are correct molecules. <laughs> Any constraint on the bounds on the bonds you, you use? Yeah. So um, here we've kind of offloaded that responsibility to the fragment design step. So um, the fragments there are such that if you create single bonds between them, between any of them, you're guaranteed to have uh, <laughs> a molecule that RDK will be happy with. Now, that won't necessarily be a synthesizable molecule. That won't necessarily be a stable molecule. The energy might like be uh, very big. So then you enter in the realm of like multi-objective optimization or like multi-parameter optimization, where part of the reward might be is this molecule realistic, synthesizable, etc. There's a question in the back. I just wanted to add something to uh, Prudential's question. So I think this is also like one of the strengths of the uh, framing the problem as a, a, a sequence of actions, um, because then you, you get to design, to design your MDP and in the rules that govern the MDP, you can put a lot of prior knowledge. So uh, some methods that would work with more flexible representations of the data. So if you work uh, purely from smiles or if you predict instead the 3D coordinates of the, of the, the molecule, uh, there's nothing that really get, guarantees you that's, that actually are possible in real life and respects uh, the laws of physics. But if you frame your molecular generation problem as a sequential decision-making task, you get to design the MDP, the, so uh, what rules govern the transitions from states to states. And in these transitions, you can bake a lot of, uh, you know, 
knowledge that has been accumulated from physics and chemistry. Uh, and so one of the things we could talk about uh, a bit more near the end, but uh, building the molecule from, from fragments is one way to instantiate that problem as a sequence of states and actions. And another way would be, for example, to instantiate it as a sequence of chemical reactions that can actually be operated in the lab. And so these are the ways in which you make sure that the molecule is actually uh, chemically valid and synthesizable is by designing the MDP. So in a sense, the, the framing as a sequential decision-making problem uh, is, is, is much wider than just the particular method you apply, in this case, GFlowNet. It's really like a, a different mindset to the framework. Um, uh, hi, uh, my question is regarding the uh, scoring function. So in the case of this notebook, it's a very uh, simple predictor, like pretty fast. But um, is it possible to like plug in more like like other things and not necessarily like neural network based uh, scoring functions? Uh, yeah, and how is the all easily implementable is that in practice? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if we go back right to the way we designed the setup, um, you're right. This is like exceedingly simple. It's like a fingerprint and then a linear layer. Um, you're right that this could be anything as long as you're willing to pay the computational costs, right? If you had like infinite compute, you might want to like run DFT here <laughs> and get the exact energy. We don't have infinite compute. So um, depending on your patients, your compute resources and the level of like accuracy that you want, you're gonna make some trade-offs between different reward functions. Um, the cool thing is that there are frameworks that automate this straight off. I don't know if you've heard about multi-fidelity. Uh, they are trained to understand what the cost of each like level of approximation is and what the error of each level of approximation is. And uh, in theory, <laughs> given a budget, they will find like some optimal within your space um, by doing this right trade-off between the different oracles. Um, now that's a whole other problem than what we're showing here. And, and and maybe to come back to your question, like what can be here? Yes, it can be anything. Um, if you're you know, willing to pay for a very large neural network, that's fine. If you're willing to wait for docking to run, that's also fine. Um, really anything that kind of is what you want to optimize works. Another common strategy is that um, you can approximate some oracle with a neural network and prioritize what you send to the oracle according to some you know vision optimization heuristic uh that's another very common strategy yeah i think there was another question yeah um hi uh so i have a couple of questions so the second one is very general uh the first one i wanted to know whether there are any uh libraries that help us visualize the data distribution on a fragment level, um, particularly using some sort of dictionary of fragments, such as the ones that are described above. And um, the second one is, um, so between different libraries like PyTorch or DeepChem, uh, which could have the same sort of data sets, uh, is there any difference in the data distribution there um, or like the smile notations or something like that? Okay, um, so to answer your first question, I'm not sure, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I was asking Manny to <laughs> you know anything. No, but uh, I think it's kind of also easy to do. Like you can compute like a, a count fingerprint with other kids, so it will give you like atom environment, and based on that, you can use that to get the distribution of atomic environment on all your molecules. So you can also like decompose your molecule into like fragments using breaks, decomposition, or recap, and then get the same. Yeah. For the second question, I guess it's about like more than libraries. There's an underlying data type that you're representing your molecule as. Um, even if you just think about strings, there's different ways to encode molecules as strings. There's like smiles, smarts, selfies. And if you train like a, a language model, 
transformer, LSTM, whatever you want, on these different representations, you'll be doing different trade-offs implicitly because the model will kind of see different things. Um, then there's graphs. So this particular library operates at the graph level. So it thinks of the molecules or the fragment graph as a graph and uses a graph neural network to make predictions about what to do about this graph. Um, and uh, I mean, there, there's other modalities, but like different libraries will will make these different assumptions. And there's the model itself, like within the graph <laughs> uh, community, there's maybe a hundred now, if not more different type of GNNs. They have different trade-offs, different properties. Um, yeah. That's something to think about when you're designing this. Cool. Any other questions? Great. Oh, yeah. So in terms of the agents and their exploration, um, is there ways where each of the agents can kind of be differentially biased? Or like, I guess, is that part of the back end, so to speak, where they are acting at different levels? Because the way you described it is kind of, you know, obviously the diversity, it makes it seem like the agents are acting equally. Is that true? I'm not sure I fully understand your question. Like, are you talking about different algorithms have different diversity trade-offs? Is that the? Yeah, yeah. And kind of like if, if the agents can ex explore in different directions, so to speak, uh, or like, are they all kind of converging in the same direction? Mm, yeah. It really depends on the problem and depends on your reward function in a way. Some reward functions are like very peaky um, and they'll tend to have like a clear global maxima and then it's not very interesting to use something like a GFlonet. You're going to want to use PPO or some other reinforcement learning thing because they they're good at that. They're good at finding this one argmax and give it to you. Um, in my experience, in in something like drug discovery, this is very rare. Your war functions will tend to be very multimodal, um, have very different parts of the state space that that have interesting properties, um, and so you you'll want these methods that are kind of diverse uh, by design, of course. There's trade-offs. <laughs> um, diverse by design means the model spends more time exploring and figuring out the entire state space rather than narrowing down on the first good thing it finds. I think maybe I'll throw it in to the question. Sure. Uh, one of the strengths of, uh, of deep flow nets is that uh, they can learn off policy. So you could you could use a whole array of uh, behavioral, uh, behavioral strategies and different policies that explore in different ways. So you could have a uniform agent that just samples randomly in the space. You could have the policy that you're learning at the moment that you sample from. You could have your friend PPO that's running at the same time in its trajectories. You can also learn from existing data sets and reconstruct the trajectories backward from there. So like anything is good to put more diversity and more trajectories uh, in, in your data set. And that's just going to increase the level of foresight that the agent can have into where are the rewards. And its role is to learn the probability distribution to these terminal states. But then how you get to discover these terminal states is completely up to your imagination and how much diversity you can you can put in. Yeah, you know, I don't see, like, just for example, in general, in this particular application, you sample proportionally to, to probability of the reward. What, what would happen, say, we, we are not interested in low reward. What if you, like, limit? this uh, probability not going to sample we're going to miss some potential or, or we boost the rewards with high probability and downgrade is lower how would it affect the uh, outcome yeah um so he actually has a paper on like this kind of question and it can actually help to kind of put blinders on the model and be like you know what this is low reward don't even pay attention to it that that can be an effective strategy um, the other effective strategy are these temperature parameters, beta, that can effectively like squish down the low reward areas. Um, and, and it's a hyperparameter, so like you have to tune it, but there's this mechanism to achieve these trade-offs and, and they can help. Yeah. You know, like, is there a downside that you'll miss some connection between potential, uh, you know, yeah. optimal uh, mix and some mix? Like, the ideal algorithm enumerates all the molecules, right? But you don't you don't have time for that. So <laughs> there, there's going to be trade-offs. Um, if you're willing to 
to not squish the reward too much, then yeah, the, the model will spend way more time exploring these areas, sampling from low rewards, just in case they're like actually high reward. Um, but there's definitely gonna be trade-offs. And like, you can hope that generalization kicks in and like your model is able to generalize uh, from a high reward region to another high reward region, but that's not always the case. I have a question about the reward function right here. Um, so in this notebook, you have the example of a sim single objective GFlow net. Is there a possibility to extend it to multiple objectives or perhaps yep. higher dimensional rewards or something like that? Yeah, there's at least three paper I'm aware of um, that do this. Um, one is one strategy is to scalarize and condition, right? So uh, if you imagine your reward as a complex combination of different objectives, you can condition your model on the convex parameters and kind of sample them at random, right? So maybe for one trajectory, you want 0.9 of the first reward and 0.1 of the second, and the next trajectory, the opposite. And as you do that, your model effectively learns a Pareto front of, of the different rewards. Right, so you query it with different preferences and, and it outputs different parts of the Pareto funds. The other strategy is to be a bit more strict and to say, okay, for this strategy, I'm going to condition you on, I want the reward, the first reward to be between you know, A and B and the second reward to be between C and D. And its reward is one if it kind of reaches that region of the reward space and zero otherwise. And you can think of that as a kind of goal, right? And so... Um, eventually the model will again be able to model the Pareto fund because it is able to understand, oh, for this episode, I want to go there. So it's going to go there in the reward space. And the third strategy that I'm aware of is um, this kind of ranking strategy. So you train two things, you train your, your normal GFLNet and then you train a reward function. And what that reward function predicts is, is the point Pareto dominated? And if so, lower its reward. And if not, put the reward as close as possible to one. So initially the reward for everything will kind of be one. And pretty quickly, the things that are parallel dominant will converge to having one reward. And uh, at convergence, you your model should only give non-zero probability to parallel dominant point. So those are the kind of three multi-objective strategies. All right. Um, so back to the, the the collab. Hopefully, you'll have you've had time to run this, maybe even to play with it a bit. Um, basically, what you should see is roughly something like this, where the loss goes down and the reward goes up. Um, so here you'll notice that we didn't have time to train it all that much. Um, Hundred steps took about three minutes. There's ways to make it faster. Uh, if you're curious, yes. There was there's a weird regime there where the loss is going up and the real loss is going up. <laughs> yeah. So um typically what happens is at the beginning of training, the the random policy that you've initialized kind of induces a certain distribution. And pretty quickly the model realizes, oh wait, there's way more stuff out there. Um and the, there's like a, a small explosion of diversity at the start. But while it's doing that, it's also getting better at getting reward. And the explosion of diversity kind of makes it so that uh, it sees new things which are surprising, so the loss goes up as well. Okay. Great. Cool. So um, again, here we're, we're looking at the, the new molecules. You know, now that we've trained our model a bit, uh, we can take an, another look. And um, so maybe one thing to notice is there's a bit more variety than the GravG algorithm. If we train this for longer, there'd be even more variety and more high reward molecules. Um, here we didn't have <laughs> enough time to do something very satisfactory. Um, but if you're willing to run this for longer on a GPU, uh, that would help. Um, there's an entire section here about different flags. Kind of going to skip it, but if you're curious, 
could be interesting. Um, I guess, I guess we have time. It's like four. Should we do the atom or cool? This is kind of an extra um, because it's a much harder problem. As Ian was mentioning, what happens if you put absolutely no priors and you let the agent design whatever it wants? So this this section shows you that. It also shows you how to use these trainers uh, in the GFlanet library, which uh, do kind of automatic logging for you, automatic prioritization for you, which can be very useful. Um, if you have you know, <laughs> lots of CPUs, it can be useful to actually have the model be generating data in parallel. And then once you're once that those trajectories are ready, kind of put them in the main process where the GPU lives, take a gradient step, that'll be much faster. Um, and so this these trainers uh, handle that for us. So here what we're doing is again using the task that we've defined uh, before. And we're setting up instead of a fragment context context, we're setting up this kind of atom generation uh, context. And we're giving like these particular atoms, disabling all the other things like charge and, and chirality, although you could turn it on if that's relevant for your problem. Um, and yeah, kind of just setting up a training loop and just running it. And you'll see that th this works. Um, but first of all, we've only trained for 10 steps. But second of all, these are the limits of <laughs> our current setup. Um, there's two things going on here, but the, the main one to see is that this is absolutely absurd molecule, but it has a reward of six, so it's pretty high. Why this happens, there's two reasons. One is the reward function we're using, as I showed at the beginning, is just a linear thing on the fingerprints. Um, this is very out of distribution for that reward. So it probably doesn't even know how to handle these kind of graphs. Um, the other is that because the reward function is very simple, it can be susceptible to reward hacking, right? So you, <laughs> you train a lot and you find the kind of weakness points of your model. If you're familiar with adversarial examples, uh, they're not just limited to images. They also exist in discrete spaces like graphs and sequences. And uh, you can think of that as, as kind of doing that. And then uh, another aspect is the reward didn't include that many heuristics to make sure that the molecule we're, we're creating is a legitimate, uh, stable molecule. And so if we had put more of those filters in, the properties are pretty high that all of these molecules would be filtered out and not given these very high rewards. So that, that was another to do somewhere if you're interested is to kind of try to uh, beef up that <laughs> those filters and make them a bit more um, aggressive. Um, yeah, just last little things about here. I'm just showing how to like automatically load the, the outputs of the, the this trainer that, that logs these things for you. Um, also logs the molecule that are being generated by the model. And here again, we can inspect the top K molecules, which are again kind of crazy, but um, uh, high reward. So the, the agent thinks it's doing his job for sure. So I think maybe we'll uh, give you a few minutes to play around with the GFlanet library. If you have questions, please raise your hand. We'll come and, and help you out. Um, and then we will conclude the lab by talking about language models and save GPT. Okay. Is there a family of reward for which the GFlowNet are better than others? I can think about like decomposable uh, rewards compared to holistic ones. Uh, that's a good question. Um, net objectives where if you know that you're you have intermediate rewards, right? So you're constructing, let's say, a molecule, and you're able to calculate the partial reward of a partially built molecule. Um, if you have access to that information, and well, if you have access to that information, you can train a GFN much faster. Second, if that reward is kind of a or monotonic ish <laughs> most of the time, that's even better because um your agent kind of learns to uh, accumulate reward. 
uh, that can be pretty powerful. So again, for something like fragments, this can kind of work. If you have fragments that are kind of designed specifically for the problem, um, the agent might be able to learn to kind of chain them intelligently. Um, but yeah, let's cool. All right. I'll let you explore a bit and maybe 10 minutes ish. All right, so uh, we hope you had the time to uh, to play a little bit with the notebook uh, and and explore the code base a little bit more. Um, we'll stick around after the last part if you have more questions. Um, so importantly, one last family of methods that we wanted to touch for uh, molecular generation uh, is that of likelihood based models. So uh, I think like you know the last the last year has been uh, marked with with the advent of like chat GPT and uh, just to prove to everyone how uh, big language models can scare. Uh, and importantly from what we've learned from these language models is that even if chat GPT was not explicitly taught you know anything about maths or anything about uh, you know, trivia questions like Barack Obama or like uh, capitals of the world, uh, it could answer successfully a lot of questions uh, by simply this this self-supervised training. And it kind of proved, uh, you know, to, to the whole community how much knowledge and how much uh, uh, can be extracted from these large data sets and these simple uh, training methods based on, on self-supervised, so masking the input, trying to recover what's been, uh, what's been uh, lost. And so the same idea can be applied to molecular generation. So we've seen that we can represent uh, molecules uh, as a string, so as a sequence of characters that describes uh, what its uh, 2D structure is like. And so uh, it becomes very tempting to simply uh, apply the same uh, models and algorithms that we know scale really well to NLP uh, to these uh, uh, large data sets of uh, molecules and their string representation. So in, in our uh, uh, space of molecules that we've been uh, discussing about uh, since the beginning of the tutorial, so we've seen that genetic algorithms are going to be really good at exploring um, around uh, the, the existing clusters by taking random steps. And then you have GFlow nets uh, or uh, sequential decision based methods that start from the origin and then try to explore this space uh, towards uh, interesting um, uh, points that have a high reward. Uh, in the case of likelihood based models and including language models, uh, what you're trying to do here is that you're starting again from, from the clusters that we know, but now you're trying to learn a, a distribution over the molecules in that space. Um, and with scale and a lot of data, uh, what you can try to hope for is that these models are going to be able to interpolate uh, between the, the points that we already exist and extrapolate outside of it. Uh, so in a way, it keeps you grounded to what you know already works, but also gives you more freedom to explore around. Um, so uh, uh, one of the works that's been uh, uh, presented uh, by, by Valence uh, recently is that of safe encoding. So uh, everyone uh, knows and is familiar with these uh, string smile encoding uh, for molecules. Uh, so simply like a string of, of letters that describe the, tree, the 2D structure. Uh, but uh, for humans and especially for models, they're a little bit hard to read. So like it's not clear where they start. And then it kind of goes in, in, you know, some arbitrary direction uh, around the molecule. And so uh, a simple idea that was proposed uh, by the safe encoding um, is basically to break this molecule into its subcomponents, into a, a set of subgraphs, like the fragments that we've generated before, and then encode out of these fragments in Smile's representation again, but then to uh, reunite them in, uh, in a single string that is now clustered into uh, more logical uh, uh, components. So you can see that these uh, are the same molecules, but uh, in the safe uh, encoding, uh, the letters that have to do with a particular fragment are clustered uh, together. And so this opens up the possibility uh, to do uh, uh, a whole lot of different uh, different tasks, uh, generative tasks uh, on this type of representation. Um, so when you you start swapping around these different uh, uh, fragments in the safe encoding or removing some uh, and trying to predict what was there, uh, you open up the possibility of performing all of these different tasks. Uh, so a lot of which are uh, 
kind of organized around um, augmenting or modifying a molecule uh, by uh, keeping its its scaffold so its core uh, uh, its core structure intact and you can also do de novo generation like you would do uh, with gflownet so all you need to do is a large data set of molecules uh, uh, encoded with this particular representation uh, pick your your favorite uh, language large language model to train and then uh, try to extract this uh, same type of information uh, from that representation um so so yeah to wrap this uh, this tutorial uh, we can take a look at uh, the part three of the notebook uh, where we uh, basically do a quick demo of what the the, the safe encoding uh, looks like uh, and show how you could uh, very very easily apply uh, something like scaffold decoration uh, from a set of uh, interesting molecules that maybe you've generated with a language model maybe you've generated with a gflow net or with a genetic algorithm um, all right so let's go back in the notebook I think we'll we'll continue in the theoretical mode uh, here, but you you can run this uh, and modify them uh, at home. Um, so yeah, just uh, importing a, a couple libraries and uh, specifically the, the the whoops the safe library uh, that contains both the model and the the, the encoding uh, encoding functions. Um, and so what we show here is basically just the difference between the. The smile encoding and the safe encoding for for a single molecule. So this kind of like summarizes some of the things I've been I've been covering. Um, but importantly, uh, one of the advantages that you can have out of the box with the safe encoding is to do data augmentation on your data set. Uh, so uh, maybe more easily than you would with smiles. So several smiles can correspond to the safe molecule, and so is the case for, for the safe encoding. But then for the safe encoding, you can swap these um, uh, and modify these, uh, the ordering of these fragments much more easily uh, to obtain uh, different equivalent representations for your molecule. So for example, in the case of uh, ibuprofen, uh, you have three fragments, and so you have uh, uh, six equivalent uh, safe encodings for that. So if you if you look carefully here, uh, all of these are the same molecule, but then to your language model, uh, uh, they would look uh, like uh, different inputs. And so you can get some data augmentation and robustness from there. Uh, and then uh, what you can do as well is uh, just take a look uh, at the, the the fragments that compose this, this molecule. Uh, so so what's cool is that uh, the representation of all the fragments are themselves uh, smiles, uh, valid smiles encoding, and so you can use them with any of the packages that that, that you use to work with, so RDKit and that all. And so here, basically, we we show how you can use the library to uh, load an existing model. Um, and apply scaffold decoration out of the box. So here we take an example uh, from the, docu the documentation, but what you could do uh, uh, as extra work is maybe to grab some of the molecules that you've generated with uh, uh, the genetic algorithms or the gflownet previously, um, identify some uh, mutation or uh, attachment points uh, that you want to decorate this, this molecule from, uh, and then uh, out of the box, you can use a pre-trained model uh, to build variations of that molecule. Um, so what we have here is that for the same scaffold, uh, now you have a, a, a perfect a reproduction of the of the center, of the core. So uh, in the case of the genetic algorithm, uh, you were locally modifying the molecule, but without any regard for what you wanted to maintain intact. In this case, it's a little bit similar, um, but now you're preserving that scaffold every time. So it may be. Uh, uh, that you're very confident that this is the the, the kind of uh, structure that you want for your particular task uh, and you may be optimizing the admit properties uh, of your molecule by by just uh, changing uh, what's next to these attaching points and so we can see that it, it uh, very quickly affects the uh, the score that we predict for that particular molecule uh, and so that could represent uh, uh, something that you would be doing in a lead optimization stage uh, of your of your program um so that's kind of like the the, the short demo that we had uh, for 
for the safe encodings and the scaffold decoration. We still have a bit of time and we have uh, Prudencio and, and Manu maybe around. So uh, I think it'd be great to leave you like another 10 minutes to uh, explore a bit more uh, this part of the notebook uh, and the uh, GitHub repository. Uh, we can walk around and answer more questions and then we'll quickly wrap up uh, before the end. Yes, Prudencio. Maybe can you explain a bit more on the model that you use for the scaffold decoration here? Yeah. Um, so I think maybe uh, you or Manu want to step in here and, and say a few more words uh, about the model. Uh, yeah. So in this case, like the model is just like a, a simple uh, autoregressive transformer. So it's a decoder only model. And the idea is that the same way that you can train like a, uh, a transfer model on tests for NLPs to something like a chat GPT, like Llama and such, you can do the same thing for uh, molecules when they are represented as tests. So in this case, it's just like learning uh, the token distribution of the safe uh, strings that are contained in your data sets. And using that, you can easily kind of like uh, generate new molecules. And the nice thing is that because uh, of the way that SAFE is represented with uh, fragment decomposition, you can easily do something like fragment constraint design, where you can kind of like feed to your uh, transformer model only part of the fragments and then ask to generate the rest. So that makes kind of like this type of like generative task a lot easier. I don't know if there are any questions about that. Well, uh, the question is, uh, uh, what library did you use uh, for fragments uh, in SAFE? Because I assume there should be some fragments uh, internally, no? Uh, like, will you ask like which? Which library of fragment do you use in SAFE? There's oh, no okay, library. So yeah, so actually you don't use like a fragment, you learn from the safe uh, representation what will be the token distribution. So in this case, like how you proceed is that uh, at least in the same safe representation, when you start with your molecule, you learn, you pick like one of the slicing algorithm on bonds. So you want to fragment your molecule. So it can be breaks, recap, exactly. So you chops them and then you reconnect them, but in a way that is a like left to right like reading of the sequence. Uh, you have some flexibility on like how you want to chop the molecule. So either you can use like existing uh, algorithm for fragmentation like breaks, recap, or uh, HR and such, or you can provide your own smart, so your own rules on how you want to break up molecules, which means that you can embed into the fragmentation some rules about like synthesizability of the molecule. So if you know that uh, I can design or uh, like I can do like a molecular synthesis in the lab only when there is this type of senton or this type of like a, a building block. So you can use that as a way to bring that into your safe representation and then your your genetic model. Any other questions? Particularly, uh, I remember on the first day, one of the slides I think Emmanuel presented uh, showed how smiles can be used to create 2.5 dimensional graphs. I'm, I'm not sure what it was meant by that, but uh, I've also like on databases like PubChem, I've seen uh, there are different types of smiles, like uh, isomeric smiles. I, I think they carry more information. I'm not really familiar, but would that affect uh, the the fragments that are generated here or, or the, the, the uh, latent representations that are made from those? I'll definitely leave that question to Manu. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, that's a good question. So the question is actually about like, uh, uh, information that's not contained in the 2D graph. Uh, so some people will say that the smiles representation is actually a 2.5 uh, 
representation rather than a 2D representation uh, because it can kind of like uh, capture information about stereochemistry. So like if you have like a uh, chirality in your molecules, which will see in 3D, uh, some 2D representation like a classical molecular graph will not capture that. So we need to add that information on the node representation. Uh, smiles capture a subset of this information. That's why we say that is between the 2D and the 3D uh, representation. And if you actually, uh, given that like smiles capturing that, uh, safe is also capturing that. Uh, but there's something that is tricky, which is how you break your molecule into fragments. So if you are breaking your molecule on uh, bonds where you have some type of like stereochemistry, like a, a trans or cis, and then when you are reconnecting them, you are not reporting that information back, you will lose that information. So it's really like a, depends on like the type of algorithm that you're using to do like bond slicing. So you will only keep all the nodes uh, stereochemistry, but not the, the bonds ones. Not, not, you might not lose them, but you need to pay attention to them. Um, is there, for molecular generation, is there, uh, can you explain the advantages and disadvantages of using, say, the GFlow net versus uh, like just a transformer trained over smart strings, not holding the, the central uh, fragment constant? Yeah, um, I think that that's like a really important and interesting question. Uh, we probably like all have opinions about that. Like, uh, I'd be curious to know what what Manu thinks about it, and we also have like opinions we we would like to share. Um, do you, do you want to start or? Yeah, sure. Um, I think like it really depends on what you want to do. Like, I think like uh, for a long time, smiles based generative models have been. Quite the set of yeah is very hard to beat actually. Uh, we are seeing more worse when it comes to like diffusion model or data bringing some like three D perspective that you don't get in smiles. But it's really like case by case. It also depends on like the type of like machine learning architecture that you are trying to use to build your genetic model. Some was a lot better with like uh, smiles compared to like uh, other stuff. Uh, but in terms of like uh, why safe is kind of a bit more interesting than just learning on smiles is really like that idea of like uh, thinking of your molecules as a set of fragments and then you can constrain the design to either maintaining some fragments or like uh, doing scaffold morphing so if you want to only change a fragment you can do that which is a lot harder for smiles uh, but you can do more or less the same thing with a uh, graph based approach like a uh, different net where you can also like do constraint design on fragments on atom and such uh, i will leave like uh, julien or emmanuel provide like uh, more like perspective on different mm -hmm. uh, yeah so i think there, there's like a lot of different aspects in that question there's the representation of the data of course so um uh, and there, there, there's the different types of models where you have like likelihood models versus more like explorated uh, minded models. Uh, in the case of GFlow nets or uh, sequential decision making, you're trusting your reward function. So if the reward function is completely off, you're going to have some adversarial examples that do not translate in real life. Um, and so they become a really important part of the generative process. Um, but you potentially have a bit more freedom because you you kind of explore the whole space in an unbiased way. Um, in the case of likelihood models, to some extent, you're a little bit attached to what you already know, which can be a great thing because you know the molecules that that we have studied are there for a reason. They work well. They're they're safe. They're they're non toxic. They have good pharma. Uh, uh, pharmacological properties and so this can be a very powerful inductive bias uh, as a space you might want to remain close of but th at the end of the day we don't really know where the molecules that we need are right and so it, it could be that the, the cure that we want for a particular disease that we're interested in is here and in that case a genetic algorithm or a likelihood model maybe we get you there more safely or efficiently but for all we know it could be that the molecule that that we're really interested about is, is super far from the clusters that we already know, um, and in that sense, uh, I, I think likelihood-based models and genetic algorithms are a bit more constrained in terms of like their ability to explore the space. Um, 
uh, a more political answer could be that you know these different methods can uh, serve at different uh, for for different applications. Uh, uh, in the case of of safe, I think what's great is that it unlocks all of these different uh, uh, all of these different tasks for from the same representation. Uh, Graph representations are also pretty flexible and powerful, so you can also do some sort of decorations and, and different other things uh, from a, a graph perspective. Um, so it's it's kind of it's very much an open question in some sense as well. I'm sure uh, Emmanuel has, has more to add on top. Yeah, I mean you covered it really well. Um, I think just just one thing is that I wouldn't actually think of those approaches as different choices, but potentially as different things that can complement each other. Um, something like SAFE will like model this really well. And we actually care about not going too far, of course, because that increases the likelihood of many bad things happening. Uh, but we also care about like maximizing reward in some sense. And I'm pretty confident that the answer lies <laughs> in a trade-off between those two approaches and other approaches that exist. About that, like we can definitely train a GFlow net, net with a reward as drug likeliness or whatever, hoping to explore part of the chemical space that resemble what we already know. So I kind of struggle to see how safe or kind of yeah, the likelihood based methods kind of have an edge over uh sequence-based method in, in that sense? Well, SAFE encodes way more than like QED, right? If if you train it to the maximum likelihood on some particular set of molecules that were, let's say, created for real, right? Then you you create this. Um... So it is, it's rather in the choice of the reward than actually in the limitation of the method, because if you, you had something that really described Okay, this is some similar to something we have seen. Let's say, okay, if your GPO net finds something that's in your safe data set, you have a reward of one, otherwise you have zero. I can guess it's, it's a poor reward system, but I can guess then you'll be loading the same distribution as the, the lucky root model. And even more, um, you'll be more amenable to discovering new part of the chemical space with similar properties to those rewards that I want, then this model. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the model choice, like the architecture choice will encode different priors, the data set will encode different priors. Those are all things to be like conscious of when you design a system like that, because um, they will influence what results you end up with, for sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Maybe this is for Emmanuel, but how does SAFE compare to selfies or group selfies? Uh, that's a very good question. So like uh, for uh, selfies, so selfies, the main difference is that selfies uh, ensure that you have 100% validity, uh, which I don't think any other sequence-based representation of molecules is doing right now, uh, but selfies don't allow you to do all of the fragment based or fragment constraint uh, design tasks. And that's like one of the things that they kind of try to bring uh, into the selfies representation with the group selfies, but still you cannot do this fragment constraint design in a very simple uh, sampling in an autoregressive way. So. Yeah, you have to define it yourself, but also like you likely need some custom algorithm to do any type of like fragment based or constraint design. No question. So maybe I missed this, but um, how do you? Uh, I guess it also ties into the question of like why you selected five as your max number of fragments. Is there a way to like normalize your reward function or normalize like I think about diversity, um, normalize your diversity to the number of fragments that you added? So you can imagine like 
if you add five fragments, then you're gonna be way more diverse than if you've only added three fragments. And so like, how does, how do you like account for that in, in this? Moment? I mean, the, the kind of cheap answer is it depends on your problem and what you're trying to solve, like maybe the protein you're trying to target. Um, there's there's definitely a sense in like, you know, there, there's way more large molecules than small molecules and like exponentially so as you grow in size. Um, so that's always something to be kind of mindful about when you design a generative system. Um, but like, Generally, you will have pretty good constraints on, let's say, the weight of the molecule that you might care about, um, and that should help limit the system as well. It's good to place upper bounds in my experience that are like a bit above what you think is good. Um, just at least let the model kind of figure it out that it needs to be somewhere in the middle. Um, but the Yeah, for example, yeah, yeah. Cool, um, should we wrap up? <laughs> you wanna... All right, cool, yeah, there's like only a few minutes left. Um, I forget if we did the slide, but did we? I think this actually kind of summarizes a lot of the discussion we just had, so that, that's great. Um, you know, generation is important, but and maybe we can take a question before the recap. Oh yeah, sorry. Thank you for the lab. Uh, my question is on the safe encodings. What is the advantage of doing uh, data augmentation on safe strings if some of the molecules that are generated are not valid? Mm -hmm. um, I guess data augmentation is like a typically good thing to do for deep neural networks, uh, and and if you have a domain where different views of the same thing uh, can be presented to the neural network as different inputs, then you kind of want to train on all those inputs, right? So the classic example for images is you rotate them a bit um, and you say, well, this is still a dog, so you should classify it as a dog. You can do the same thing for these, these safe encodings. You can put, like swap the order of the fragments. So the, the transformer sees a different sequence, but it's still the same molecule essentially so the model should be making the same the maximum likelihood prediction <laughs> all right so yeah um there's a lot of things we haven't covered today but um here's like more if you want to read about what we talked about today um there's a lot of old school, but also new work on genetic algorithms because old school stuff tends to work really well and hard and can be hard to beat. Um, there's some cool new GFLO network that we're doing at Valence and beyond, at Mila and beyond, um, including something that Julien was mentioning where like your MDP can be synthetic actions uh, and reactions. And um, yeah, there's there's safe, but um, Lots of different groups are thinking about how to use language models within chemistry, um, including language models trained on like papers and natural data and, and just like trained on molecules and uh, things like reactions and all that. So um, those slides are on the portal page if you want to click on all those links. And with that, uh, we'll be around for a few minutes if you have more questions. Thank you. <laughs>